pleasant task to pursue the subject. We, we began with the two or three talks, and perhaps with this one, we might be able to make some basis for the foundation of spiritual life. We talked about the possibility of an integral yoga, and that is a process of inner growth in which the individual, is, his own consent becomes necessary to begin the process. It is open to one to want the highest truths, and then it, is, it depends on him whether he makes a move towards it, fast or slow, whether he does it alone or in company. And I drew your attention to this also, that it requires a priority to be given to this process. It cannot be done by a divided attention. I have a quotation from Sri in which he has written to a disciple about this divided mind in the pursuit of spiritual life. He said, with a divided mind, you should not be surprised if you do not arrive at the results of spiritual life. It is the first priority that must take up all the activities of the inner being and slowly build up not only an inner life, but also influence the outer life. That is to say, the mold of life is to be completely changed. We are in fact out to change the very foundation of human nature. And that requires single-minded attention, concentrated effort, an intensity uh, which uh, may be limited to human capacity, but should not lack in sincerity. To, to, to the disciple, he replied first that I cannot promise that within a given time you will have a result which will enable you either to go out into the world with a stronger spirit or succeed in the yoga. For the yoga, you yourself say that you have not yet the whole mind for it, and without the whole mind, success is hardly possible in sadhana, means in spiritual life. Whatever the way may be, you must accept it wholly and put your whole will into it with a divided and warring, is it? Wavering, yes, will. You cannot hope to succeed in anything, neither in life nor in yoga. So that uh, emphasizes the necessity of, uh, of wholehearted consecration to the purpose of spiritual life. And the factors which we drew attention to last time were aspiration, rejection and surrender. I do not want to repeat all the details about these processes because we have done something to cover the preliminary ground. It is like, as I was beginning in the, in the beginning, I told you, it is like changing the foundations of a house. The human nature is founded on matter, on inconscience. The present constitution of man's nature is founded on inconscience. It begins with a fundamental inconscience. And there is certainly a growing and developing consciousness added to the human individual on the basis of his materiality, on the basis of his inconscience. We are body. And as body, we are equal to matter. We are the same as matter. We are life. And as life, we are almost on the same ground as animals. So that man's present constitution is founded on a fundamental or essential inconscience with an increasing degree of well, life force which makes him equal to the animal and an added mind and conscience which make him the human being. But the basis even of conscience and mind is matter. So the basis of ignorance, with this makes ignorance, the basis of inconscience is ignorance. This basis we want to change and establish some other basis here. 
That is why it requires that concentrated attention. Now, how to change the basis by aspiration, rejection, and surrender? What form will this aspiration take? That is a question. It can take any number of forms. The forms of aspiration are practically unlimited. First, it differs with different men. And with the same man even, it will differ on different occasions or different times. One man wants peace, another man wants control, third man wants introspection and self-knowledge, fourth man wants power, fifth man wants knowledge, and so on. Even the same man will aspire for different things on different occasions. One day he sits down and feels like praying. Second day he feels that I want to know what I am doing and why I am doing what I am doing. Third day he has seen some want of self-control and he wants to control himself and say, I want to acquire self-control. Aspiration, as I told you, general for force of aspiration is like a flame. It's like fire. And the fire well, seeks its own fulfillment in, well, in, in pointing out to the human individual in whom the flame arises the need for moving upwards, moving towards that higher foundation. So aspiration in its ordinary movement is not limited. Unlimited forms exist of the aspiration. And each individual should adopt, adapt it to his own need every day. Every day it will not be a mechanical process. It's not as if you must constantly do only one thing and pray only in one form. One day you are not in a form of prayer. Then you, you try to remember your aspiration even while you are working in the process of ordinary life, in dealing with other people, in the services uh, of the house or in management of an estate, whatever you are. There you remember your aspiration and try to bring the light of aspiration in the work which you are doing. Aspiration not only can necessarily confined to the period of meditation when you sit down. Meditation is meant only to give us a practice of putting our whole energies of mind at one point and then applying it for the, la for the whole 23 hours. It is not as if you remember for half an hour and then forget everything about meditation or uh, the aim of life for 23 hours. That is normally the attitude of the religious-minded people all over the world. All over the world their idea is that it is like <laughs> a debt which you have to pay to somebody. God is somebody to whom you owe something. And you say, all right, you have some, we have some reverence and respect to give you, half an hour we devote to you, here your half an hour. Now, 23 hours and a half is for us, devoted to egoism, desire, ambition, selfishness, greed, everything else. We can afford to forget. Now, that is exactly what has perpetuated the realm of ignorance. That is how the force of the divine has not been able to come to the help of man, because man, man didn't want it. But when once the aspiration is made and the resolution and single-minded, you know, I mean, uh, intensity of flame has been awakened, then one wants to remember it all over the day. It takes many forms. And yet, human nature is the same everywhere. And it will have, therefore, to establish some common foundation in his nature if he is to change his nature radically from the basis of ignorance to the basis of, well, uh, divine life. If divine life is to come to men, he must change the foundation. And what will be the first basis that he will lay down in the foundation? When he tries this aspiration, he will have many things to reject. He will have also to learn to surrender. But during all this process, he finds that his nature is restless, disturbed. Uh, does not allow him to, uh, to to carry out the process. It is supposing you have got a, found, a house already, whose foundation you have to dig out and put other foundation in its place. Well, normally we find that uh, the man's uh, human nature is disturbed, all the time restless, uh, never under unified control, uh, never one strain of the whole movement of consciousness going towards one direction. It is as it were, it is divided into many channels. This disturbed condition requires to be set right. And therefore, normally, the aspiration in men, when they have followed a certain process for some time, will take the form of...
asking for calm to be established in nature. The first element which one would want to establish in nature when he has understood the need of changing the whole constitution of nature will be to aspire for calm. He will say, I will do everything, but first give me a condition in which I am able to look at myself without being disturbed, without being all the time you know, subject to knocks of nature from one side to another. So the first condition he will do when he sits down to aspire will be, yes, he will want calm. And when he asks for calm, he will find that perhaps he is more disturbed. Uh, so long as he doesn't care to establish calm, he may be left alone and there may be movement of calmness in his nature. But the moment he says, no, I want to establish, not merely contact the, the calmness of nature, but I want to make it a permanent part of myself. Well, then he might find that he is more disturbed. If he is sincere and persists, the aspiration for calm is sincere, intense and persistent, then he will find that gradually the calm is coming down. The calm is getting uh, into him. He contacts the calm. And then if he looks deeper, some people get, you know, scared by this calmness. I have seen some people. When their mind becomes completely calm, they feel it has become empty. Some of them even think that they have lost their intelligence and might become completely idiotic. You see, this is quite an un, unfounded fear. It is no, no, there is no ground for fear. When the calm comes, it is, one is so unaccustomed to it that one feels perhaps he has gone into an abnormal condition in which he is empty of everything. He is now vacancy of mind and emptiness and the emptiness of all content. He feels as if now he is in a condition where nothing good will come to him or nothing, something untoward will happen to him. This is not true. When calm first comes and touches the nature, the aspirant, the man who is trying to change the foundation of his nature, should wait a little and not be scared by the emptiness which begins the calm. Afterwards he will find that the calm is something solid concrete, strong like a rock or like a mountain. It is something that gets established in nature. If it is established, it makes the whole nature unshakable under all shocks of outside life. And one is able to watch oneself in that calmness, see what is going on and separate himself completely. In fact, still deeper when one goes, one finds and inquires from where does this come from? First, one feels that, oh, I make and made an effort, I, I aspired for it, I put my will, I put my force, and I brought the calm. But where was the calm? It's not something newfangled creation out of nothing. Calm was there. And this calm was really above. It is not produced from below. It, is, it comes down from above. If one watches quietly and aspires in complete silence, one will feel that the calm is not merely arising, but also descending from above. And it can penetrate into his intellectual being, his mind, his emotional being, his vital being. It can penetrate into his nervous system, begin with the head, come down into his you know, spinal cord and right down, go deep down into his very physical constitution with the nervous center, through the nervous centers. That is the experience of the calm. This calm, really speaking, is not something that belongs to, uh, to this part of humanity, which is manifested. It is something that comes down from part that is to be manifested yet from potential human perfection which we envisage. We want to change, as I was telling in the beginning, the foundation of human nature, is it not? The first element to be put down into this human nature here is to take away the restlessness, the egocentric movement, the disturbed condition and put in its place calm. When calm is put as a foundation, then the, the process of, you know, building up the whole, uh, whole foundation also can go on. It's not the only element, calm, peace and equality, equanimity or equality, whatever name you want to give it. These three would be the foundation for creating the complete change or bringing about a complete change in human nature. 
the calm must become a concrete fact of inner life and it should become it is the really speaking a, a property or quality of our true being this calm is not something brought from outside it is the power or the quality of our true being the self as we call it the soul it is one capacity of the being which we really are which first makes itself felt here to our nature as calm that is what comes down from above and it should be established here not merely contact and many people have said feel that oh once or a while when they have the contact of this calm they feel oh that's quite enough i know what is that there is some very fine condition in which i can go but that is not enough for the work that is to be attempted the work to be attempted is a complete change of human nature in that case the very foundation has to be changed and in the changing of foundation the restlessness and the disturbed state of consciousness or inner being should be replaced by attainment of a peace or a calm which will come down from above and this calm is really speaking something that belongs to the higher nature of our being it's a power of the true being that is coming down we want to bring the true being into expression in life we want to change the ignorant life into a divine life because the divinity is potential in our very constitution it is somewhere deep down and the way in which it makes itself felt in our life or can make itself felt is the bringing down of its powers and capacities into our human life well calm is the first power the second thing that can come in the wake of calm is a peace now there is a little different between calm and peace even when there is a calmness there may be a disturbed ripple on the surface of nature it is uh, you know as uh, when the calm is established it is easier also to carry out the separation of the witness self and the flow of energy of nature the self separation of the witness and the nature part moving all the time to which i referred last time the dichotomy in nature in which one is able to separate a part of his mind or his heart or his vital being and watch the flow of nature as if quite outside himself as if something belonging not to himself but to nature to somebody else he is able to watch his own movement of flow of thought flow of feeling suggestions ideas impulses all as if they didn't belong to him that capacity or power of consciousness which can watch can see undisturbed all the flow of energy of nature it can work best only when the calm is there when the disturbed condition is there the the witness self is not able to see and observe the movement of nature on the basis of calm it may be that sometimes when calm is there some ripple of disturbance might take place just as some distance might take place on the surface of sea or water that's a minor movement which really speaking does not disturb the established calm calm in its in its constitution is more or less like a firm rock which does not allow any disturbance to take place and allows a possibility of a quiet observation peace is more intense in its working in the sense that in the peace there are more positive elements present of the higher nature in the peace you find a sort of harmony and a settled ease a sort of ease a sort of <laughs> tranquil joy you one feels a tranquil joy in that peace peace is a further degree of intensification of this experience of calm calm solid undisturbed an atmosphere in which nothing can come and shake the condition of consciousness and allowing one to observe quietly all that is to be observed in the flow of nature it, one is able to understand in nature far better in this calm in the peace one is able to penetrate deeper in the sense that he is able to have a settled ease a sort of uh, you know a, no, enlightened joy he feels a, a, a presence of a harmony in nature and this is 
a greater and more intense capacity of our true being. In fact, it might be the first fringe or first contact of the divine presence. The divine makes itself felt to the human individual in the form of this settled peace, not merely the peace that comes and goes. And when you observe the movement of nature internally and withdraw and watch quietly, one will feel that this peace also is a power that comes from above slowly descending into the human system, human being. Peace comes from above. It is not created from, uh, you know, from outer element. Peace is not something, it is here already, there, somewhere. You find it when you go to a powerful, great landscape or height of a mountain or go to the white sea, immediately even the uninstructed fields there are some vibration that comes to him and sets his mind at peace. It is there. It is present. In the human being it is, well, taken through the vital being, taken through his sensation, taken through his imagination. But to the man who is making a spiritual effort, he is making a special process, a resorting to a special process to bring this down into himself. Well, in that case, he will know that it is something that is coming down from above. It's a power of his true being that is at work. And it is perhaps the first beginning contact of the higher presence that will gradually grow uh, into his being if he pursues the process to the end. When the calm and the peace have been established in the human nature, in one's own self, then that has to become a part of everyday experience. That is to say, uh, something not available to oneself only at the time of meditation or when one is quiet, but something that you maintain throughout the day in the activities of life. Because that which is not established, well, it cannot be called foundation. Foundation is that which gets established. And in this, one has not to be in a hurry. This is a slow process. One is out to change the very you know, structure of human consciousness, the psychology of man. And we are out to change so thoroughly as to change ordinary human life into something which will reflect the, the, the life of the deepest divinity in oneself. To change the human life into some reflection or some, some image of divine life. Well, in that case, the whole of life has to be pervaded by these higher elements, the calm and the peace. Even that much, you know, is a great advance. Even some glimpse of calm or persistence of aspiration, rejection and surrender. A, a constant desire, not desire but aspiration I should say because I drew your attention to the distinction between desire and aspiration. So a constant aspiration for the true aim of life, the constant aim to reach the goal of perfection, which has been promised to man, which is there, already promised in the sense that the aspiration is something undying, irrepressible. The aspiration cannot be rep repressed by any effort, effort of man. It is there. And it is taking hold of this great aspiration that one slowly moves towards well, elimination of ignorance of himself and founding of divine elements in his constitution. It is that way that earth nature will one day undergo a change. It is not by a, a sudden miracle that things will happen. Even this happening is itself a great miracle. When one succeeds in establishing a peace in his being or a calm, it is something very extraordinary in the sense that it is an element which does not belong to normal human nature. It is a miracle. But the miracle which nobody easily sees. But a miracle which works all the same because it elevates life to a higher plane, not only of the individual, but with, with, with those, uh, it elevates the life of those with whom one comes in contact because it establishes quite a different vibration. The vibration that is established is quite different. The vibration of ego and of desire is one. The vibration of calm and peace is quite another. You cannot miss it. It is not possible for anyone to ignore it and make as a whole. Oh, it doesn't matter whether it, don't, it matters a great deal. It really is that because what happens in actual, as actual events in life is really speaking a result of what has been prepared within. And if that which is prepared within is calm and peace, something settled, a power of the true being of man, 
it is bound to make itself felt. It is dynamic. It cannot remain without producing its effect. If you put a hot object here, you cannot uh, prevent its, uh, you know, its, uh, what you call, uh, it is radiation, is it not? Yes, it is, chemical term is radiation. The radiation is inevitably there. Well, if the constant aspiration for higher truth for the divine and the supreme is all there, and all the time one is praying for and bringing into his consciousness calm and peace, it is bound to make itself felt not only in changing his own life, but in the, in the life of people who come around. It, it may not be visible. And it's not for those results that one attains these, uh, these uh, you know, elements of his uh, divine life. One makes this effort because one is attracted to the truth. And whether others get advantage of or not, one is not concerned. But it cannot be ineffective. That is true. The third element which is the foundation of the higher life, after that, you know, the, the life can go on growing on the dynamic movement of aspiration, rejection and surrender. But before that can become effective, the peace, calm and equanimity or equality must be there. Equality means a capacity to face the context or actions and reactions of life. What comes to one, what happens to one, well, Mm. with an unmoved consciousness, without allowing personal and egoistic reactions to go out from oneself. Equanimity is a power of facing all contexts without being moved. It is not merely the calm. Calm is a settled condition of consciousness in which disturbance does not take place. But equanimity is dynamic and it faces life. Equanimity goes into practical life and there it establishes a firm impersonal basis of action and knowledge. What is the basis of this equality or equanimity? that all personal actions and reactions distort our perception of events, of persons, of forces, of movements, of objects. All that we react personally, well, has always a distortion. It is not the perception of the thing as it is. It is always some distortion has taken place already. A coloration has gone into it, a sort of a, you know, change of well, what it was into something which it must not be has already taken place. And then a correct movement on the part of oneself is not possible without equanimity. Without equality, it is not possible to react correctly to the reactions of the world outside. When equality, equanimity is not there, equality is not there, then one acts on egoistic and personal basis and then those actions set up other reactions, and then they set up other reactions, and it goes on as a chain which has uh, all repercussions which do not tend to the increase of the spiritual vibration in life. It is equanimity when you realize the equal basis of life. What does equanimity really come to? Equanimity really comes to this, that this whole cosmos was not made to make X, Y or Z happy. When one is not equanimity, has no equanimity and reacts powerfully on a personal basis, he reacts on the basis that uh, the world is not as he would want it to be. When a man, you know, it is like putting oneself into the center of the universe and then arranging or trying to arrange the whole world around oneself on the belief that this world was made to make me X, Y or Z happy. This is the difficulty. You see that the, the whole structure, the whole cosmic movement, infinite forces and universal power were not made to make X, y, make X, Y or Z happy. When one loses this equanimity, then he acts on the basis that he, act, ego, is in the center. His desires are the most important things 
of which everybody must take cognizance. His likes and dislikes are so important that everybody must know and respect. Isn't it? I mean, that is, that is how one acts normally. We find that that is how human beings always act. And it is that which goes on creating misunderstanding, conflict, uh, want of harmony, disharmony, all that because the action and reaction that proceeds from the uh, temperament is not the same, not, not what it ought to be. Equanimity is attained in three ways generally. In Sri Aurobindo's scheme, there is only one method. But in general, the human nature can react in three ways and attain to equanimity. If the man is intellectual, he separates himself in the mind. And they call in Sanskrit the word is udasin, sitting above. He sits above the actions and reactions of nature and looks at them. He has got equanimity in the status of his mind where he separates himself and sits above and watches the actions and reactions of his own and other natures, undisturbed and untouched by what is taking place. That is one equanimity of the intellect. There is another equanimity that is based on the exercise of willpower. One makes it, it is called titiksha in Sanskrit. Titiksha means power of bearing, power of equally facing all actions and reactions of nature. Cold and heat, all right, he stands with his strength and says, well, not reaction to, to anything. Happiness and suffering, same reaction. It is called, you know, an equal reaction to the dualities of nature. If success comes, hold himself back. If failure comes, hold himself back with a force. Same. He is throwing it back with the same, you know, power of resistance and same reaction to both. The one is standing above. That is, you know, Uda seen sitting above and looking as to what is happening below in the hill. You know, he's sitting on a mountain top and watching his own self and seeing what follies he's committing. And that way he remains undisturbed and untouched. That is one equanimity. Another equanimity is he uses will and says, yes, let me see. I'll go out in the cold and not feel the cold. I'll go out in the heat and not feel the heat. My equal reaction to, this is physical, but the same in psychological reactions also. The third is an element of surrender or nati. In the sense that he feels that whatever happens, happens because there is a supreme will that is at work. And whatever is given should be accepted well with delight. If suffering comes, he thinks it is the, it is the you know, something sent from the beloved. The divine has well, given this dispensation and it is like a present. If the present is such that normally a man would be unhappy with it, well, he says, whatever normally man might be doing, for me, this is something as a gift of the Supreme, and I must respect it as a gift coming from the Supreme. And therefore, he remains undisturbed. He looks upon it as something that is dispensed to him or given to him by a great power that manages this universe. There are th th three ordinary ways. In Sri ways way, he would say that the power of equanimity is really founded on unity of soul, oneness of being. Why one should be equal is because there is one self, one soul. And therefore that which is given to oneself from what one calls somebody else is really the, that which happens to him uh, from his own being from another center. That is all. And therefore, he does not look upon it as if it was meant for his ego, for his personal vital likes and dislikes. He puts it aside. Equanimity, really speaking, is perception of universal unity and bringing that power of that unity in our own nature. Not merely a mental perception that all is one or, or a feeling in the heart that all are one but a dynamic application of this unity in details of life. It is, as it were, well, the, 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 the power of the infinite universal is equanimity. 
equal support extended to all, the saint and the sinner, good and the bad, good elements of nature and bad elements of nature. Who supports? A cosmic power supports. A self that is infinite supports all that. And when one brings this equanimity or tries to bring it into his life, he is trying to bring that power of the infinite to one into his own life. He reacts to life on the basis of his infinity, on the basis of a true self, which is wider, wider, greater than his ego, than his personality, than his mental ideas, than his idealism, than his ethics, than almost the world, greater than that. He acts from that basis. So that when one brings or tries to bring equanimity in life, he is really trying to bring the light of an all-pervading consciousness and make it active into his life. When he is not bringing something for himself, remember, all this effort is really change of human nature. We are laying down the foundation of a new building, new building of man. And in this new building, foundations are something to be brought from above and put here. Not to be kept there, but put here. Well, bring the equality of the Brahman, of the infinite consciousness, of the one that is in all, and one that is all, into the nature part. And that will create a condition in which, first, the light of the consciousness will grow, light of the truths will grow, light of the divinity will grow in oneself, and it will have a corresponding effect on people who come in contact with us. So that these three things, there are some dangers also to which attention can be drawn. Equanity or equanimity, equanimity or equality is not, you know, uh, indifference, passive indifference or inert receptivity of everything. When one is equal, he is not, you know, indifferent. That is to say, you take up a part of sadhana and you are not able to control yourself. Then you remain equal, you say. No. It is equal indifference and not equanimity. Equanimity is a station in the realization of the wideness of self. And that wideness of self knows that the defects of nature have to be removed. Therefore, when you are in the equanimity or samatha, you do not uh, put up a, a, a condition of neutral indifference. Indifference to whatever happens. No. You have a positive will. A will which sides with the infinity that you are, but does not consent to the play of ignorance either in you or outside. For instance, there can be a passive, you know, inertness, a passive acceptance, not only indifference, but passive acceptance. Supposing you are ill, then one says, well, accept illness. Uh, you would not accept illness as a movement of the, of the Supreme in you because that's an element that has grown from the ground of ignorance. That is an element which is present in the nature on the basis of the present ignorant constitution, the present basis. Whatever comes from the present basis of a play of ignorance is not accepted. So that uh, it is the same thing with a wrong movement of nature. One is not able to control himself. Say he is addicted to drinking or to smoking and he wants to give it up and he fails. Then he says, I am equal in temperament. And I am equal in no, it is not. It is really speaking an inert acceptance of nature, which is not equanimity. Equanimity is is is, is something that is stationed in the wideness where knowledge is the dominant power, light, and that light is such something that will not tolerate any play of darkness. You see, I will give you an instance of how this works, and it is a complex thing. That is why. He puts it very strongly, sincerity is a test. You cannot make a dead rule that in all conditions it will act only in one mechanical way, attainment of equality. For instance, Arjun was faced on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in the, in the Mahabharata epic. There is an episode where Arjun, the great you know, 
the fighter and the leader of the army is faced with the question of either fulfilling the duty of a warrior or killing his own kinsman. That is the position, is it? Most of you know, roughly at least, you see. He had his cousins who were his opponents in the division of the kingdom. And he was faced with a double standard of life, whether to follow the, the, the duty of a warrior who fights for the righteousness, for the truth. Well, in that case, he has to fight his own kinsmen, his own cousins. And he has to kill them. And then killing one's own kinsmen is a sinful act. So out of the two, there was a struggle. And he could not decide and he had to ask Arjuna as to what is the standard and what he must do, what he must avoid doing. Now I'll see Krishna at the end of it when he has taught him all that was to be taught, told him that now you must fight. With equanimity, he was made to fight because there come occasions in the life of man when he might be in a position where he cannot uh, remain what you might call either neutral indifference or passive acceptance or an inactivity which would amount to accepting falsehood. You see, there one has to make his position clear. That is not a breach of equality. It is equality itself that dictates the, the, the necessity of taking up a position in life where the equanimity would want elimination of certain elements from life. And if those elements have to be eliminated, either by uh, moral resistance or by uh, an organization or by taking up a position and making yourself clear, one has got to do it. One cannot afford in the world where dual forces are at work, forces of falsehood and truth, light and darkness, forces of truth and falsehood fighting with each other, one cannot uh, uh, say that because he is equal, therefore he takes no position. That would not uh, be in consonance with the spiritual life. Equanimity is a, a condition of inner consciousness where the inner being is free from egoism and personal reaction. One does not look upon anyone and his enemy. One does not have any personal reaction against some cause or some person whom he happens to oppose. These things one can one has to eliminate within himself. And the glowing example of such a uh, position is the life of Mahatma Gandhi in India. That he opposed many things of the British government without having any enmity with anybody who was English. It was not a question of person or anything. It was a question of carrying out certain values in life. There you cannot say that no, because all are the same and all are equal, therefore, no, therefore you cannot afford to, uh, to, to remain without taking up a position on the side of what you know to be the truth, what you know to be what must be done. Well, that has got to be done. There you cannot plead equanimity and remain either neutral or indifferent or passively accept oh, oh, what you know to be wrong to be going on. That is the necessity, necessary hint that one has to take and guard himself against a false show of equanimity which might really not be equanimity at all. Well, these three foundations, if they are secure, then there is one more point which I would like to make this evening, and that is the place of work in the growth of man in his spiritual life. Because in Sri scheme, Work occupies an important place as a means for spiritual growth. People have been always in the habit of thinking that work is something external and spirituality is something internal. This is an artificial division which has no basis in reality. Really speaking, nothing that happens outside is unrelated to what happens inside. All that happens outside is a projection of what one is or has done inside. A man acts from inside only. And the very same act might be a result of two contrary causes. I'll give one example to make my point a little clear. A religious act might be not religious at all. In the sense that it might be very ordinary, mechanical, conventional and full of ordinary vital desires of a man. While an ordinary movement of a merchant or a lawyer, if he can carry his attitude of surrender and aspiration into his profession, it might be a spiritual act. 
while an act of religious life conventionally done mechanically followed or done with a certain ordinary motive is is quite ordinary unrelated to anything spiritual doesn't make a man move forward at all in his inner life this has to be understood by many people for instance i give another ordinary instance you take a list of people who subscribe to the war fund an ordinary instance in war time there is generally the war fund is collected is it not and you take a list of people who have subscribed to the war fund. Now it looks as if they have done one act. Which act? Subscription of money to the war. This is the outer act, is it not? But if you go behind and watch, why so and so gave money? Then you will find, oh, he gave money because uh, probably, well, he was forced by the government or some pressure was brought to bear upon him. The next man, why he gave money? Then he said, well, he wanted a big name and he gave it because of his big name. Why the third man gave money? Then he said that the second and the third happened to have equal financial status. And if this man gave $1,000, he must also give $1,000. If he gives less, his status will be not equal. You understand, a fourth man gives money because he's taking war contracts and probably he thinks that if I subscribe to the war fund, probably the military department or the government will give me contracts more easily, isn't it? And a fifth man does it for some other reasons. One and the same act and you find so many different reasons. So that it is not one act. It is not the same spiritually. It is not the same. And did I give you the instance of how uh, an act which might appear like uh, charity would not be charity at all sometimes. Absolutely not. You see, if, uh, so, uh, take young five or four young people who are talking and very much interested in a subject either of radio or of uh, cinema stars or something. And they are interested in talking on uh, what was the result of the match or something. And some beggar comes and happens to come where here, of course, beggar is not allowed. But in a country like India, well, they don't mind a beggar. So if a beggar comes and you want to get rid of his nuisance, you throw a coin to another foreigners or something and you get, you, you get rid of him. Now, this appears as if it is charity. It is not charity at all. You are paying for your convenience. There is no charity at all. See, it appears as if he has given something to, he has not given anything. It's a price paid to get rid of nuisance, nothing else. Whereas supposing you are going in darkness of the night and it is raining hard and a blind man is going somewhere and you know that he will be injured, you take hold of him, you put him in the right place and put him in a place of safety where he is not, you know, subject to the inconvenience and inclemency of weather, well, nobody may know it. Even you yourself may not be conscious. It's a very great act, very great act. It is insignificant. Externally speaking, it is very small. It is great, spiritually. So that action is not to be judged by its outer form. Action is something, from where does it proceed? Well, that is only standard for judgment of an action. So work and spirituality have been divorced in our life. People think that, oh, to work, you cannot pro progress spiritually. This is quite wrong. From where do you work? Yes, can you make your work an offering? Then it can be spiritual. Can you do a work without desire and make it as a perfect offering to the divine? Work only for him and so to say and deliver over all activity to him. Unmindful of the result or the reward or uh, whatever comes out of the action. Well, then it can lead you. It can be a spiritual act. It can develop the man and move him, make him move toward the spirit. So that work is something that can be made into a means for spiritual growth. This is a great thing which Sharunda has brought into the, the life of yoga. That life is itself a field for spirit to manifest. It is not a field for desire and ego and ambition all the time to go on, it, it can become a field where one can bring a higher light to bear upon the, the what you call the, the business of life or the actual dealings of life. If one can establish an attitude of desirelessness in the action, egolessness in the action, and an 
attitude of offering, attitude of sacrifice, or attitude of fulfilling a divine will, even in his action and works. Well, if that can be done, then a beginning for, beginning of, uh, of spiritual progress through work is made. So that work could become gradually a means of elevating the human consciousness, relieving him from the bondage of his desire, ambition and ego, and taking him more and more towards a universal source of power, will and action. First he acts as if he is the actor and he is the sole responsible agency for carrying out the work. Naturally because he feels that he is the ego and he must do it. But gradually as he grows in unselfishness, desireless and egolessness in his work, he will feel that uh, the powers that are given to him are not his own. All the force that acts in him is not his personal property in the sense that it belongs to him exclusively. The powers that are, that are given to men are those that he derives from parentage, from society, from his religion, from his past, from his present, from values of life, from teaching, from friends, from books, from all kinds of things. He is made up of so many currents. So that he gradually feels that that with which he is working is not his own, but a power that is given to him. He is an instrument and not the actor. He is not the doer, but only an agent through whom some power is working. Then his egoism of the actor or I am the actor gradually, you know, becomes less and less, diminishes and he becomes more and more the instrument of a universal force, a mental power, a why a willpower that is flowing through him, so to say like a current of electricity going through a wire. There is only one danger that one may have if he is not pure in his motives of sadhana or spiritual life, that he can have a great egoism of the instrument. There are people who have gone wrong with this egoism of the instrument. I am the instrument of the divine. Cromwell actually committed any number of murders in the name that I am the instrument of God. See? <laughs> so, uh, Muhammad did the same thing perhaps to a good extent and I think many Mohammedans who followed him with best of motives. I don't say they were wicked intentionally, but uh, one gets so much infatuated with the sense of being the instrument and the, and the force of the current that is flowing through oneself is so abnormal, I mean from different from ordinary human capacity, that one almost feels justified like Hitler to feel that he is somebody who is sent to do something wonderful to mankind and bring about a new era and new age and, and you know, it is terrific. There, if one is sincere in the pursuit of spiritual goal and truth only and wants only to fulfill a divine will, then one is saved. Otherwise, the ego of the instrument sometimes is the most dangerous thing because the, the vital being of the individual catches hold of this current of power and simply diverts it into horizontal or lower channels of life. Therefore, in this instrumentality or experience of the instrument, one has always to see that it is completely egoless and one knows also that everybody else also is the instrument of the divine. Only one may be conscious instrument, others are unconscious instrument. The whole world can be the instrument of the divine. Through, through all a purpose might be working. Only the advantage of the yogi or sadhak is that he is conscious. And he consciously identifies himself with a divine power, where others well, receive the current through ignorance and therefore lose all the benefit of spiritual progress. Well, spirituality consists in a growing consciousness. Spiritual sadhana or spiritual life or yoga is growth of consciousness, more and more consciousness, widening of self. And in this widening of self, this egoism, the instrument should be given up and it should be ultimately an identification with a cosmic power. Then one carries out the will of the divine without deviation, distortion or diminution. And one then feels that through him, a supreme power is carrying out its will directly. Well, that would be the end of yoga pursuit through works. Works means life should not be looked upon as if it is external. It should be always connected with the aim and should always be connected with the psychological origin from where the action proceeds. Well, if these elements are 
considered and a new foundation is prepared, then on this foundation, the surrender of which I spoke last time can then allow the higher power to build up his divine life. This is not yet the divine life. This is the basis or foundation of any possible divine life that can come to the earth. It cannot come on any other basis. It has to come on the basis of an established calm, peace and equanimity, a tendency to turn all activities of life, including outer work, into a sacrifice to the divine. Then it will be possible for the higher power to create here a foundation on which it will be able to build up a divine life. This is not divine life, but this is the foundation of the divine life. Because the divine life will have to be built up by the divine consciousness and divine power. When one has surrendered to the divine power on the basis of this equality, peace and calm, and turn work into a into worship, into an offering, then the divine power will be able to act into human being in such a way as to make divine life possible for the human being as an individual and as a collectivity. That is what Sri Aurobindo is looking up to as the future of man. Man's future is not bound up with his present constitution. Man is not a full point of a process. Man is growing. And the very fact that he feels that he is imperfect is a sign that he has to attain perfection. And there must be a means of attaining that perfection. The means is there. Means is the will and the decision of the human individual. The moment the individual has taken a decision, he is capable of following the path without any affirmation of a philosophy or a religion or a ceremony or anything. Straight away, and that is, as I again repeat, the great contribution of Ramakrishna, Paramahansa and Sri Aurobindo, that there are no outer paraphernalia required to pursue spiritual life and reach the goal of experiencing religious truth as a concrete experience. This can become concrete if one can put the aspiration, rejection and surrender into operation and make the foundation of higher life on the basis of calm established in nature, Peace and equanimity and works turned into well, an act of offering to the divine. Well, if these four elements are satisfied, then a basis or foundation of the divine life would be laid. And the, the integral yoga then would make possible the full fruition of all the capacity of the human being. The integrality of integral yoga consists in not only fulfilling the intellect or the heart or the willpower, but all the instruments of nature would be ultimately clement to perfection in the scheme of this divine life which is envisaged by Sri Aurobindo in his great work, not only life divine, but also in the attempt that he made in creating the ashram at Pondicherry. There, you actually find 1400 people at least at one place trying to live that kind of life and about 140 centers all over India and about two dozen centers all over the world where people are trying to follow this so that it is not something which cannot be attempted by ourselves, present humanity. And well, I have come down here only to contact the younger generation and groups who are interested in the higher values of life so that I would be able to find among young people the future that is going to be the future of mankind. I hope and I am perfectly sure that there is certainly a very good material in the young generation that is growing everywhere in the world, including here. And I do not believe there is any exclusion, uh, you know, exclusive privilege to any country or any race or culture. I think that uh, there is a fine passage from Sri window which I would like to uh, read to you. Our aim is not either to found a religion or a school of philosophy or a school of yoga, but to create a ground of spiritual growth and experience and a way which will bring down a greater truth beyond the mind, but not inaccessible to the human soul and consciousness. All can pass who are drawn to that truth whether they are from India or elsewhere, from East or from West, 
all may find great difficulties in their personal or common human nature, but it is not their physical origin or their racial temperament that can be an insuperable obstacle to their deliverance. So there you see it is very clear. And he says there is one indispensable condition, sincerity. And I think that that is a fit ending of uh, the general outline of Theravindu's integral yoga. I think with that I close to the, and a desire to to do something only without there is full knowledge of what is to be done for correct knowledge. There's a good fermentation. That's a good sign. Forgiveness again. I surrender where you accept uh, what comes to the will of the divine. Mm. Uh, yes. And ask people. Um, uh, if something goes wrong, yeah. then, then do you. Uh, just how, do you, how do you take uh, this positive? Yes, uh, you see, um, I only recounted as a, as a method which is current. It's not that. Sri Aurobindo would approve of it. You must know, when I recounted the three methods, that were only to show that on each instrument of nature, intellect or, uh, you know, willpower or, uh, you know, the emotional being, one can attain this kind of equanimity. But Sri Aurobindo would not call it perfect equanimity. Oh, he, he would not call it perfect equanimity because if you accept everything is coming as a gift of the divine, you might stand to compromise with the powers of ignorance. Right. Yes, that is to say, you are not participating in the process of change in that case. You are allowing things to happen. And you are not allowing yourself to disturb. That is your gain, naturally. But Sri Arundo says that equanimity has two sides, passive and active. You understand? Now, a passive equanimity might be satisfied with uh, uh, attitude of accepting everything as coming from the divine. But active equanimity would require that he must side with the divine will which is at work also. You follow? There is a divine will at work in the universe, in life. And it has a tendency or a direction in which it moves. And the sadhak or the spiritual man is expected also to actively cooperate with equanimity with the divine will. You understand? Yeah, I like to thank him very much because I don't like the idea of being... Yes, exactly. There are Indian, in India, you know, devotees, uh, so-called, and re to some extent good people, I mean, nice people, who would all the time say, but it doesn't matter. Well, in that case, if you say it doesn't matter, uh, only life does not accept that position or doesn't matter. To life it matters. To life it matters which way it goes, right or wrong. You see, and you being an, an individual endowed with consciousness, with a sense of right and wrong, you are expected to exercise that right, not merely to run back into the infinity or the divinity and say, well, the divinity will do everything, then why are you there? Yeah. Divinity does not act by a fiat of you know, miracle. It does not drop from, like a bolt from the blue. It works through human instrumentation and expect the human instrumentation to side and stand on the side of the divine. That is the fulfillment of the individual. That is his chance, in fact. If he does that, he helps himself and helps also the divine's work in life, which is important. After all, uh, the earth consciousness or whatever has manifested on earth has to reach a goal a receding goal, an infinitely and eternally progressive goal. I do not say goal, today's goal is one, yes, super mind or divine truth or reality, but perhaps after that there will be another. I do not want to put a limit to the possibility of the divine possibility in man. It can be, you know, progression into infinity or eternity. But as well, living individual and human being, one is expected to attain if he makes a spiritual effort both passive and active equality or equanimity. And in the passive equanimity, yes, one can be in knowledge of why the divine is, is uh, doing something uh, through Hitler 
I give you a technical instance for instance. You see why the divine is doing through Hitler and why you should or how you should also counteract that which the divine is doing through Hitler because the divine through you also wants to put Hitler down perhaps. Who knows? Okay. Yes, that's it. <laughs> you see, because uh, uh, it is necessary to, to understand this thing on the basis of a unity. Unity should not make oneself indiscriminate in his uh, capacity of judgment. The discrimination must be there. And yet no personal reaction, no individual egoistic movement. What one has to eliminate is egoism and reaction of the personality. Personal reaction, desire reaction, ego reaction, or something that is moved by likes and dislikes, hatred and, and, you know, attachment. No, that is not there. But you look at it from a higher point of view, and yet there is an active attitude to be adopted. And I think that is what Sherundu would call real equality, perfect equality. That's the equality of the, of the Supreme, who creates something evil and also sees that the evil doesn't triumph. See? <laughs> Is the result to the divine. One puts his own will and his whatever possible action comes to him or inspiration and leaves the result to the divine. He is desireless. Even when he acts. And perhaps that way is a more potent action than action driven by desire or impulse. It's a much more powerful action. In country, people aren't seeing for tomorrow. Have you made an analysis of what percentage of the people have taken this seed as it has been started? You see, the, the way to look at it is not the outer quantitative aspect. This is a work of quality. Yes. So that even if one man takes it, it's quite enough. You see, because uh, such a change, so radical a change, you don't expect on a mass scale. You see, but a, a change that gradually begins with uh, 10 people, 20 people, 30 people, it begins like that. And then only it becomes a, a possibility for other people to, to take advantage of. As you similarly take the case of a scientific research, a scientific invention. When motor car was first found, perhaps, uh, you know, nobody was able to afford the expense of buying a car. And it required a Ford to see that, supposing I want to make it cheap, what to do. But first motor car, perhaps, was very difficult for people to go in for. Afterwards, it became very simple and cheap and everybody can go. Now, even an Indian villager who doesn't know what's a car goes, takes advantage of it without knowing what it is. <laughs> in such a short time. Too. Yes. So, it's the same thing in a spiritual life yes. also, that when first the, the higher truth comes, it does not, uh, everybody can't accept it. Perhaps it's like that. You see, the humanity is like a pyramid, you know, pyramid, yes. And uh, only the top is touched first. And then it receives, then it, it goes like that, you know, until it uh, takes the whole, whole pyramid is again, you know, gets it, that light which began at the top, perhaps, or, perhaps at one point or two points it begins, but it goes on increasing. That is a process. Cultural process also is like that. It begins with a few, but it's not confined to the few, because it's meant for all. Ultimately, the, the, the fulfillment is for all men. It has one day to reach. When and how? Well, it is the individual's business. In an age of democracy, we cannot force a man. At least it's not. <laughs> we cannot compel him like the communists say, no, we must make you happy whether you like or no. <laughs> then if you don't like, we'll put you against the wall and shoot you because I must make you happy. <laughs> you know, happiness, or you must have happiness. Otherwise, how can you? If you don't admit happiness, all right. <laughs> <laughs> There's been much talk, you know, about the subject of the development of the individual and uh, perhaps the eating of meat or not eating of meat would help one to attain to a higher field in you know, mm -hmm. development. Yes. How could we uh, speak on that subject? Could it 
is it quite a personal thing or could it be a uh... yes it is it begins with person spiritual life begins with personality oneself and when one finds that there are half a dozen persons or ten persons pursuing the same object and the same process then if they consent to come together, they can come together and pursue a common object and create a common life. Ultimately, it will have to create a common life by common consent. I think, Purani, I think his question was about the eating meat. The eating of flesh. Oh, meat. He was asking whether that would make any difference or whether it, it would yeah. make some difference, not in the deep psychology, but in the vital being and in the nervous system and in the physical being. It would make a difference. You could say then in the higher frequencies as you travel into other realms then? Not uh, frequencies. Help to Food is not the only determinant of spiritual life. Mm -hmm. This is one important thing because it is conventional and social. It's a question of habit of the body, more or less. Coming down from generations and so on, it is not as if uh, you know, food determines all the inner movements. It does not. No, there are many things not. that are inherent. I know in of people who are not, I mean, non-vegetarians and who are very pious and holy. I know. Yes. And I know vegetarians who are not at all pious and holy. You see, no? <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know that. So, yes. that is not, I see, I was once in Gurukul Kangri in Punjab. And uh, there in the Punjab, Ari Samaj is one section, one sect of Hinduism, reformer sect. And uh, there are two sections in it. One is uh, non-vegetarian, one is vegetarian. And they were in Haridwar, and I was in Haridwar for three months. So every day, one uh, in the morning, 45 minutes or what, 50 minutes, I used to give some talk to them and to people who came naturally. And those people living there in Haridwar, there was an institution, college. So. Both parties had professors in that college, so they used to come and listen to our talk. I was talking only about uh, the spiritual life and nothing to sect or anything or Veda or Upanishad or Gita. They are all good so far as they contribute to man's growth. But uh, they were very particular about vegetarian and non-vegetarian, so they used to come and say, but don't you think, so I had to say, look here, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that vegetarian diet automatically and mechanically purifies human nature. Then they said, no, but so and so books, they brought books, you know. I knew them. I know the books, Bhupanishad says or Brahmana says something. And they said that, you see, when you eat, the what you eat is divided into three parts. One part goes to your material body, second to your nervous system, and third to your subtle body. Now, there is some sense in which he must have said, exact sense is not known, it is symbolic. This is in Upanishad, what I am telling you. And in some Brahmanas, there is a mention that uh, cow's meat is cooked and a uh, soup is prepared and the Brahmins were eating. So I said, look here, this is one that you point out, I point out this in the Brahmanas, that the cow's meat is cooked and soup is made and the Brahmins are eating. Now how do you say that this is not authority and this is authority? That is how I said authority for authority, you must reject both. Now, if you come to experiment, I said, I can give you one experiment. And that to me is decisive. There is some influence by food produced on human physical mind and nervous system and probably vital being at the most. It produces most effect on the body. Supposing you have to do very hard work, perhaps you require non-vegetarian diet because, you know, digging operation or mining or hard work on the field and so on. It requires uh, something that will support the body in that hard work. There, perhaps, vegetarian diet containing proteins might help you. I don't say that it is indispensable because somebody was talking to Bernard Shaw that, you see, meat-eating elements are the strongest. Lion, tiger. Then he said, what do you say? Look at the elephant, he said. <laughs> he is a vegetarian. <laughs> Look at the bull. Bull is a vegetarian. You can't say he's weak. So don't tell him. <laughs> but that is humor. <laughs> so I told him that, look, if you want to experiment, I'll give you one experiment. There is a sect in India called Jains. Jain. They believe in, you know, Mahavir. 
the Tirthankar. And non-violence is the breath of the religion. Non-violence to the letter. Letter means the religious priests go with, so you know, bands here so that the germs may not be killed. They go with a very soft broom, you know, hair of the animal and sweeping the floor so that un invisible insects may not be killed. They were sweeping the floor. Oh, they, they go with, you know, wheat flour uh, to the ants, you know, the ant hills and there put the flowers so that the ants may not have to trouble to, may not die of starvation. <laughs> well, well, well. And extreme case, I'll tell you, which is very humorous. In Ahmedabad, this community is very rich. They are very rich persons. They happen to be rich. So, they have bugs in their bed. Now, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Now they have not, but once upon a time they had many. And what they used to do, they can't kill because Jainism will not allow them to kill. So they would collect them in a box. <laughs> box. And put them in a room. And pay a man one rupee, two rupees to sleep there so that the bug may not starve. <laughs> you can't have a greater absurdity of religious belief than that, I suppose. This is the greatest absurdity to religious belief. <laughs> This is, I have seen this when I was a boy. It is now gone. It is now gone. But I have seen the place which they used to keep in a street, you know, a, a place where the <laughs> bugs were put and a man was paid to sleep there because the bugs must have something to eat. They would not know that it is cruelty to the human being. <laughs> How a man can, you know, lose his mind. Uh, and lose the m main principle. He's a human being. You are subjecting a human being to an inhuman treatment. The very contradiction of Jainism. But they won't understand. <laughs> well, well. The, I told them that these Jain people have not take touch meat. They, were, they won't take potatoes, you know. <laughs> a, a strict Jain won't eat po because it's underground. There are germs, oh. insects, <laughs> and no potato. <laughs> For a giant, no potato. So, they, they, huh? What do they eat? They, they eat, uh, you know, what their whole schedule is given. This is the food in which insects are least harmed, so they will take that food. I used to argue with them that even vegetation has life and you are killing life. I used to tell them. <laughs> and make them very angry. <laughs> but uh, there, you see, they... Now I said... From 2000 years, he was contemporary Gautam Buddha. This Mahavir was contemporary Gautam Buddha. Both lived at the same time and 50 miles from each other. Gautam Buddha and Mahavir were contemporaries. And this Jain sect started with Buddhism. Buddhism has disappeared almost completely. Jainism is very small, very small following, almost microscopic minority. But it is there. They are very persistent, very strong. And I said in their generation for 2,000 years, nobody has taken meat. Nobody has taken a potato, you imagine? No. <laughs> what must be the purity of their nature? If food purifies and if vegetarian diet makes a man pure, they must be angels almost, <laughs> which they are not. They are as selfish and as egoistic as everybody else who takes meat or does not take meat. So. It makes very little difference in life, whether you are accustomed to a food, well, you go on. If you find in your conscience something objects to taking life, you change the food, that's all, gradually. It's not, this is not as if spiritual life depended upon food, not at all. I know Sir Akbar's case, for instance, where Lady Hydri was so sensitive that if the fowl was killed in her presence, she can't take the meat on the dish. But she cannot do without non-vegetarian diet. She was so full of you know, sensitiveness that if the fowl is killed in her presence, she can't take. But she can't do without uh, non-vegetarian diet. And she's quite a very, very fine person, very fine person. Religious-minded in every way, noble and, and very aristocratic, very good. There was nothing that simply because it was not there was something wrong, nothing of the kind. 
So that I think, don't think is a very, very big item of spiritual life. It must suit the. No, I agree with you. It's one <laughs> to hear your comment. <laughs> oh, that both ways. It seems as though it's uh, it's still to the individual. Yes. Just to take fish, because all Bengalis take fish, almost except the Vaishnavas, except those who follow Vaishnava religion, all Bengalis take fish. Can be destroyed. It's only converted into that. Yes. To yes. Apply it. If one feels that this is not good, well, one can give up. It's not, a, mm -hmm. it's not an important item right. on right. which uh, yes, one should base his spiritual life, so to say. Oh. Body and change of bodily habits may wait for some time. There is no hurry. Change of consciousness, that is important. Desire and impulse and egoism and selfishness, that request will be replaced. And that can that is the most important part of the work. And bringing in the to make the truths active and dynamic in life. Yes, actually, reality. Not merely a moral principle or uh, intellectual idea or some uh, ethical good or altruism. No, a spiritual reality, a divine truth which man is. And these many people don't. So I have given her a paper called What is Spirituality? <laughs> and if someday we happen to get it published, all of you will see it. <laughs> what is spirituality? I have just given her a paper. So we have to see how to get it into form. Because the ideas are there, but all right, I'm doing good, I'm doing this service, this, that, some sort of, it's a good thing. It's better than follow one's own selfishness, it's a good thing. So we don't discourage, but it's not spirituality. Mm -hmm. Spirituality is acceptance of an inner truth, which is independent of this mind and life and body, and which is self-existent and it's a reality. Yes, it is something of a different order of reality than what man is accustomed to know in ordinary life. And it is a pursuit of that and bringing that into life which is the problem. How to bring that to bear upon life, individual life, change the, the, the structure of life, the form of life, the way of life and so on. And the change will be inner, change will not be outer. It will not be that the house will be upside down, no. The house will be this. And yet, a man who lives in it will not think it is his house. It's a marvelous thing that will happen, the greatest miracle. He will know it is not his house. He will own a property and know it is not his property. And know it, know it means, uh, know in the right sense of the term, not intellectually believe and feel. Know it literally that it belongs to God. That will be the time when there will be no disarmament. It will begin with 20 people, 10 people, 5 people, 100 people perhaps, and spread. It won't be that all will happen one day, no. <laughs> Too many selfish people to, to, uh, to say, what, don't be mad, they will say. <laughs> they will say sometimes, <laughs> I talk to an English professor, I am telling you why, because Professor Cyril Bailey of Oxford, you see, now retired, he's 85. And uh, when I went to England, I went, met him. So I talked to him, nice man and everything else. And then we talked about, he read Sirundo's biography and told me, oh, I never knew he was so great a man when he was here. I knew him only as a brother of Manmohan Ghosh, but I never knew how great he was. Now I know that he was then. We talked about some uh, problems of life and spirituality and then I told him casually in course of talk that, uh, you see, one can experience and realize God or something. Simply that. Uh, he told me, Dr. Burani, that passes my head over my head. <laughs> 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 so that the very best people sometimes, you know, right. and uh, he knew that I was talking, we could expose, make an exposition on a subject which was quite understandable. But when I talked about this, he thought that there was a screw loose in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that he's a good man, nice man, talks quite sense, 
But here, <laughs> it was uh, some screw is loose. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that uh, there was something closed, that's all. <laughs> I thought, didn't think it was a screw loose, but I thought the, the whole thing was closed and there was no entrance, that's all. <laughs> because to believe in such a possibility, I think, yes, a little out of the way, nature is good, nothing wrong. I mean, if you become only conventional, you only go by... Oh, by what what has happened, but you want some new thing to happen, then you must allow new possibility. If you all the time say that you can't go to the moon, you can never go to the moon. <laughs> yes, is it not? So if you can say that, no, we can go to the moon, it requires a lot of effort, lot of money, lot of technical, all that we understand. But now you, if first you think that you can, then you make an effort. It's the same thing for spiritual life. If one can, one has to then make an effort, that's all. There are conditions here to be satisfied, as there are conditions anything great to be done. 